Um, my talk today is called Blood Brothers, the Anzac Genesis, and, and Vincent alluded to the to the backstory that in some ways you could say this is what built us towards the inevitable Anzac um, relationship that our two countries have. So um, my background is that I'm actually um, born to a child who was named after someone who died in World War One, And so my lifelong stories have been built um, from my mother's side of the family with very strong connections. Oh look, and there she goes walking through the background. Um, with commemorating and honouring rather than celebrating and being quite aware of um, both sides of, of the battlefronts and not glorifying them. My father was Korean Navy um, with the British RN, so I've got a very strong military history background on both sides of my family. Uh, about 10 years ago, I came across this book uh, written by a Queens, then Queensland-based um, historian called Jeff Hopkins Wise. So a lot of uh, what I want to talk about today is come out of this book as well as Vincent's book. So in the beginning, um, in the peak of the wars in the 1860s, uh, a, a, an Australian military man, George Dean Pitt, was appointed by the New Zealand government to, to manage and recruit more people to fight in the wars. And after the initial round of, of advertisements in the 1863, there was this second round and the family that my husband descended from joined up in this second round from Victoria. So I wanted to show you a lot of the um, records that are available because most of us in the room will be family historians of some sort and may be interested in seeing the kind of records that you can get out there. And mostly it was interesting to me just how widely the articles in the newspapers were published around Victoria. So in this trench, um, the government official notice was actually from the 14th of January, 1840, 1864. And it was in the papers on the 15th, the 16th, and, and sometimes even later in some regions, and commonly in the Age, the Argus, and the Goldfields Mount um, Alexandra Mail. So it was kind of all over the place with a full detail of what was being offered. So they were being offered, I'll say, just need to fix my screen, I guess. Can't see properly. So they were talking about what they get, what they get, how they would be looked after, what they would get as settlers, and it was very clearly aimed at people who wanted land and a level of security. They instigated a full rate of pay, and I love the fact that they've got bread, meat, groceries, rum when they were in the field. I suppose that was there to keep them going, um, and. And so there was a whole list of what they were going to be offered. It was meant to be as an appeal that was worthwhile compared to their current situation. They were also, as, as Vincent mentioned, promised land. The allotments were at different levels depending on the way they served. But there was a limited number of allotments, so they may not have one guaranteed to them unless they met a variety of conditions. And naturally enough, the people at the bottom of the tree, the privates, were last. But I was particularly intrigued at finding this website on the Waikato War and it, it summarised the numbers which I found in quite a few other locations but I felt this was an interesting table to see that Victoria was significantly involved. And if we think about um, Australian history at that time, there was certainly a lot of frontier wars. There's a number of books starting to come out now in Australia about the internal battles with the Indigenous population or the First Peoples, as I think it's more accurate to call them now, um, the people that were there before. And thousands came over to fight here. And so the statistics now show that about 1,784 to be precise, uh, and 34, 31 Australians are listed here. So people were actually enlisting in the same way we often hear they did with, during the war in, in later wars, when people were doing it for adventure. So there was a combination of land as motivation, pay and security of food and shelter, even though we know it wasn't that great, it often was better than what they were experiencing. Um, and so there was quite a significant volume came specifically from Victoria and served in the Waikato Regiment. And they were um, having what their um, 
their wives and families were also paid to come, which was extremely useful for them. But it wasn't just that. The Australians were also involved in providing provisions and supplies. And this tender document, which you can see here from the, the Herald in Melbourne, they wanted 7,000 pairs of cots and blankets, 6,000. So I'm not quite sure why you didn't get as many blankets. Maybe they, um, they, they felt you could, you know, didn't need one every day. But all the clothing that, that they were actually, had business relationships with the Australian markets. This was not solely a, a Melbourne Victorian thing, but I'm, I'm focusing on Victoria because that's where my husband's triple great grandfather actually came from. But in a more general sense, there were other key areas. So there was naval support. They supplied vessels. Could you believe that? They were commissioned and built in Sydney. Um, some were towed over whole and some were built here in parts at Port Waikato, where the first naval base was actually fully established. And when those of you who know Port Waikato today might find that quite a surprising place to have your naval base. As Vincent mentioned, it started the, the process of war correspondence and Howard Willoughby was the first one dispatched by the Argus and he left in July 1863. If you look globally at the British colonial newspapers and you can do that through the websites of your local library. So for those of you that are in Auckland, it's the e-resources. You can find a lot of interesting information being reported through the uh, Illustrated London News and the other colonial papers around Australia as well and it was as if you were listening to the news we're hearing today which we're having in the press every day the New Zealand wars which were often referred to as the Maori wars were in the press every day and they may be in there in multiple places within a paper so it was of great interest and if you can remember like in the 10 years before there was the Crimea war which was similarly in the papers here regularly as well but They'd also had the gold rushes were starting to ease off. They were starting to get shortages and things. So there was a keen interest in anything happening somewhere else. But once we got here and things weren't as expected, charitable collections, balls and events were held in Australia to raise funds to send to New Zealand. So those very early days of relationship, of friendship, camaraderie, business and military relationship, all started happening in these 1860 timeframes. I found this interesting table uh, on Wikipedia, but I certainly read um, more historically supported documents as well. And there were river boats because as you, those of you who are familiar with the Waikato, uh, to come right down in, into the king, the, towards the king country, you're needing shallow drafted um, vessels. And we didn't have them and we didn't have a Navy. So it was the early days of the start of our Navy and six of these eight boats were commissioned out of Australia. Uh, even one came from as far away as Adelaide um, in South Australia and Gulwa, both out from further afield. I love that one's called the Gundagai, but the rest have um, more localised or English names. Um, there's some lovely images to get a feel for this boat that was towed across. And, and look how much it cost. Eight, 9,500 pounds in 1863. That's a huge amount of money. And it arrived in Onahunga on the 3rd of October. So it was here for that first round of events. There's a very good book on the Waikato um, gunboats, uh, well worth getting a copy of if you can. And the draftsman did some wonderful drawings and to the point where miniaturists are able to build these models based on these diagrams but I thought you'd find some interesting, particularly the Kaharoa, who was put together at Port Waikato. But as it is ever thus, we don't necessarily all agree with whatever's going on with our governments and our policies. And there are extensive debates in the Australian newspapers on a regular basis as to whether they should or shouldn't be depleting their local resources uh, by sending so many people over here and so many other resources. And I found this particular newspaper quite interesting. Its entire formatting was quite different to the other papers in Victoria. 
And this is the paper that's centred around Castle Maine, or Castle Maine, depending on where you're brought up, and uh, which is the heart of one of the goldfield areas. And it had a lot more flashy ads and much larger font and really loud, bold print. Um, and I loved this flashy uh, heading, the kidnapping case. And really they called uh, the Pitts Militia, which was the common terminology for what became the Waikato uh, Militia Regiment. Uh, and they called that he was kidnapping their people. Um, it's a different form of enticement to be uh, signing up and, and being kidnapped. But it is ever thus, is it not, that this 28th of the January article is just 14 days after that first official announcement from the New Zealand government. There was a lot of government debate as well. I, I could have given you hundreds and hundreds of, of clippings of articles, but uh, I did think that this didn't need to be that long a talk. So let's talk about it from a family history point of view. I'd like to introduce you to the William Davis family. William and Mary actually married in Somerset, came out to the goldfields, and they had four children there before they left in that February 1864 and, and arrived in Auckland at Queen's Wharf. Um, so I found one photograph on the internet, unsourced, that's believed to be the wife Mary. She's a bit of a scallywag because um, sometimes she's Mary, sometimes she's Mary Jane, and sometimes she's Phoebe. And I'm not quite sure what the backstory is behind that, so there is more research to do. But the interesting thing that is an entire family, they moved from Hamilton in the 1880s and they went to Sydney. So this family went from Somerset to Victoria, moved extensively in the gold fields, ended up in Hamilton where they stayed continuously through into the 1880s. Then they went to Sydney and they dispersed in various directions after that. So just to show you the earliest record that I've been able to find of the family is their firstborn son in 1855 in a place called Forest Creek. And on the right, you can see that William is age 23 and he's a cabinet maker. Uh, so it's worth gathering the information. The later birth, he, the, he's the miner. So he is a, a clearly acknowledged as he's in the mining game. He's trying to find gold. And for those of you curious about what it might have looked like, this is around the time they arrived in 1852 engraving of, of the conditions at Forest Creek. By 1862, they were actually living on the outskirts of Castle, Maine. Uh, they'd moved into the general area of Forest Creek as well. And you can see it's quite built up. In fact, uh, it, unfortunately, I can't find the specific occasion, but you can see there was a large gathering around the town hall and town square and the major centre buildings. But it's a reasonably well-established uh, Main Street town. But you can see in the distance the gold diggings and it's very reminiscent for the Kiwis of Gabriel's Gully and there wasn't quite the same size as township, but we are talking over 10 years later. So this is what they left to come to New Zealand. I found that they um, arrived and there's very good newspaper notices. In fact, there's commentary in the Australian newspapers, literally giving you a day-by-day -day experience on board while they're waiting to leave. And what they hadn't got a surgeon yet and the food and so forth. So there's some very interesting constant um, reporting going on here. Uh, the health of the passengers, which I thought was, you know, it was all about the ship for a long time. You had to get, the humans were much lower down. Yeah, we even found out all the biographical history of the ship before we got to the fact that it was a really good passage and they were in good health, but three died. Um, and well, I don't think that sounds like a good journey to me, but again, this is the interpretation of history. And you'll see that the families actually came out. But the fascinating thing is there were four William Davises on the ship. So as a historian, one of the things that one has to do researching is be sure you've got the right ones when you're looking further afield. So William and Eliza had children, William and Charlotte, and William and Jane, not Mary, not Phoebe, had son William, had a daughter Mary, had a son John and a daughter Ellen. And those all line up with the names used in the Victorian birth registers. But I'm not sure why she stopped using Mary and, and wasn't using Phoebe at this point in time. I started wondering about them as a family, not just the military aspect. So I wanted to know, oh, 
how did they get down to, you know, on a hunger? Because I know that's where the military was based. And so even then, within a day of their arrival, it's in the paper that they arrived, they got there to Queen Street, and they were instantly handed over, and the women and children were conveyed to Onahunga in omnibuses and trays, while the men took to the road on foot. I think those kind of extra little details of imagining their day-to-day -day life are quite interesting, which you can find in the papers. There are also, of course, the usual etchings, and this actually ended up in the London Illustrated News as well as the Melbourne Post. So you can see this is where they were based and stationed. And when I, and Charlotte was talking about those, I think it was Charlotte, the 20 men in a hut, a, a tent together wasn't good. I just wonder how many families were even in one of these. Um, but here's the early settlement. And some of the earliest maps from the time frame as well. Um, and you can see where Kirikiriroa is, that's the, um, it's the Māori name for Hamilton, which means a uh, long gravel area. But I wanted to just focus in on a couple of things about it. You can see where Auckland is. I'll just move my mouse. So Auckland was here. They came down to Onahanga. But the main route into the area, which was there, to, they were coming for settlement, was either through the water through the mill this way or up to Drury and then over the hill. So the boats were needed, but the, it's fascinating that detail that was from this early 1863-64 map. The Auckland Library website has a number of databases you can search and I could find the, the militia volunteers and armed constabulary and here we have one of the William Davises who was um, on the Thomas Fletcher. This one signed up in Kynston, which is an area just outside of Castlemaine. And he signed up on the 21st of January, which is within a week of the first newspaper notices going up. Uh, he was born about 1831, and his regimental number is 259. Well, right next door is 260, with a little bit more details about his place of birth. Um, but he signed up on the same day. And so that gets a little bit more challenging. Uh, but he got a land grant as well. His land grant is lot number 295. And I'll just go back. The other guy got lot number 100. So maybe I can work out which one of these is mine and which one is married to Eliza and not mine. So I did some more research and found some maps. And I felt it was fascinating that the land was surveyed in 1864. And by 1878, they had a very long list of plots arranged, though I'm sure there weren't that many homes on these lots. And even in 1895, they updated it. And so for those of you that know Hamilton, this is the railway bridge, which first came over into what's now near Garden Place, uh, under the old Pollock Mill. I've got the name, the Heafy, goes to Heafy Terrace. Uh, and here's what was initially called the Union Bridge, but we know it now as the traffic bridge and it had foot traffic on it to start with. So this is the early settlement. And when you zoom in, you can see that lot 100 is here in Collingwood Street and so is lot 295. I hope I wasn't delivering the mail to William Davis of Collingwood Street because I wonder how many times they might have got it to the wrong fellow. So it wasn't helping me decide which was which. But I did find this extensive Australian site by Ian McFarlane, and um, thankfully it had a little bit more information from those early sign-ups. And I suspect this is from this side of the Tasman, and of course I haven't been able to get out as much as I'd like, so I wasn't able to confirm the original document. But on the 5th of March, which I would expect is the date here, that they signed up in Onihunga when they finally walked down from Auckland. You can see the one that signed up from Kynaston was a shoemaker, the one from Castlemaine was a cabinet maker. And if you recall on that early birth certificate, William is a, is a cabinet maker and carpenter. And he often uses cabinet maker, carpenter throughout the, um, the, his documents. So I'm pretty sure that number 260 is my bloke, so that my bloke was at land 295. But I wondered how these families were coping. And there was a lot of editors, uh, letters to the editor from locals and worried about the families, worried about the militia. And again, it could be quite extensive 
the, the number and range of correspondence and concerns with the general public about the ability to feed them, um, particularly in, in this case, this, this notice is from the 13th of February. So this is two weeks before the ship has arrived from Melbourne, and it's about two weeks after the ship has left. And they saying here they barely had sufficient to keep the current uh, troops from starvation. And the public of Auckland are generously doubling the bread donation ration doled out by the government to the wives and the soldiers. And what folly there appears to be to bring more families here to starve unless more than half a pound of bread and half a pound of meat is given to them. So these things are so interesting to read about the general concern of the community towards the people who were coming from another country to do what they felt was the right thing to do at the time. But the sad news was that on the 14th of March, a summary was given about the, 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 the various initial uh, batch of settlers that year. And unfortunately, you can see that six of the people who'd come on that Thomas Fletcher had died. And one of them was a 13 month old daughter of William. And it was one of my William's children. Notice further at the top, Peter Landy also lost a daughter at that point in time. It's always good to read all the names, but unfortunately, only nine months after arrival, they lost their 10 year old son as well. And William Henry, their, their firstborn child, who was born in the 50s, back in the goldfields, he died. And I have yet to find out whether there was any causes in any newspapers. I've not been able to find anything. But it's noted that his rank or profession was he was the son of a Waikato militia man. So a child aged 10 can have a rank and profession because they're the son of a militia man. So I wondered when the family first ended up in Hamilton and the earliest next record I could find uh, was the 2nd of October in 1865. And uh, I know the militia first got into Hamilton in, the, in August in 64 and that there were periods of time where they were encouraging people to move down, but clearly they were giving birth at Onihanga in the November, uh, or their son died up there, sorry, in the November. So it was sometime between the end of November and the beginning of October when William and his wife, now called Phoebe Jane, moved in to Collingwood Street. And that was the interesting thing, is that in the fine print, she is illiterate, as many of them were. And as was discussed earlier, they may not have fully understood all the background and the nuances and the politics, but she's the mother in Collingwood Street and her mark was witnessed by P. Landy, the same man who'd lost his child uh, along with them. But the registrar is also interesting. It's W. Mole, I'm hoping that's how to pronounce his name. He was the Lieutenant Colonel of the Waikato Regiment. So he registered the birth. So I think those kind of little tidbits are always worth drilling down into and taking note of them and seeing the relevance. And he's only a carpenter. And again, I wondered what their life was like. And I came on the Waikato Library's heritage site, this lovely photo of Hamilton from 1866. And Collingwood Street would be running about where these trees are back across here. So these, what, what standard of housing they had back then, I do not know. I've yet to do official land research on block 295. And I do not know if they got their, um, land grant because I haven't been in the country long enough to even go and do that research in the last few years. But isn't that fascinating? Now this is the landing. Uh, the traffic bridge goes up into this spot here and across. This hotel was built the year before and it's great because it's a feature in Victoria Street in a lot of the photos. So by 1870, here's those trees I pointed to. So somewhere further down off to the left behind this tree here will be where the family were living. And this is 1885, and I wondered to myself, why did they leave? Look how much Hamilton has established itself by this stage, and yet they left. And I still can't imagine what the call to Sydney was at that time. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious now to try and find that out. I'm in contact with a family member in, in Perth, whose um, elderly uncle still alive, 
because in our family there are no stories about this participation in the Waikato militia and there are no stories about them having left Hamilton to go to Sydney. In fact, the family, when our member who was born in Hamilton died, they thought she was born in Sydney. They took her ashes up to the harbour at Manukau so she could float home. And it was only when I started doing research, we discovered that this granny had actually been born in Hamilton. Her sons had taken the three hour arduous journey um, quite some decades ago now, when they could have just taken her around the corner because that's actually where she had been born. So just the whole story of this movement of this family backwards and forwards across has gone beyond them knowing they were in Sydney. William Davis, the original Waikato militia man, actually ended up in the bushfire territory from this year, on the far south coast of New South Wales near Batemans Bay. Now, interesting to me is there was gold in the area during this time frame, and I wondered if that was his calling. Did he go down there to follow the gold rushes? Um, but thankfully, Brad took the photo and shared it on the Ancestry website. For those of us not located in the area, I, I fortunately actually know it very well, um, but these bushfires have actually ruined this, this part. But this is where they lived a number of the family and died. Some stayed in Sydney. But in my husband's case, John over here, the eldest surviving son, he moved back to live in Hamilton. So he spent somewhere about 16 years in Sydney, and then moved back to Hamilton. By then he had 10 children. He'd gone away with two, came back with 10, and then had five more. So there's an extensive number of descendants in New Zealand from this one couple. All the others are in Australia. So this trans-Tasman experience continues through many levels of generations, going back as far as the 1860s with a, that that connectivity, that friendship, that cousin relationship has continued to go backwards and forwards and as has them serving through the wars. And you will hear some more of our family stories later.